Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. Every once in a while, I meet someone new in my field, and we hit it off like fucking gangbusters. And this guest today is uh, an example of how that happens. Tony Overbay is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He is a certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, host of the award-winning podcast, The Virtual Couch, and another chart-topping podcast, Waking Up to Narcissism. Tony spent 10 years working in the software industry before returning to school in his early 30s to get his master's in counseling, and he has been working as a therapist for the past 18 years. Tony has spoken to audiences worldwide on topics ranging from marriage, parenting, navigating faith, crisis, anxiety, depression, ADHD, narcissism, and emotional immaturity. And like I said, um, meeting Tony has been just one of my greatest, just greatest experiences. We are planning on doing a whole host of things together. We are in the brainstorming process of all of that. And I really, really hope that you enjoy this conversation with the amazing Tony Overbay. Tony, thank you so much for coming on my show. I am so excited to have you on. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you. I, I am too. And and this is that part where I, I feel like I should have reached out to you a long time ago. Although I always say nobody likes to be should on. I feel that it would have been helpful for me to have you on uh, my podcast, Waking Up to Narcissism, a long time ago. Because the content that you cover, I think, is the big question that I think people get to. The, right. Yeah. You now what do we do? Stay, should I go? <laughs> and the kids. And so... No, I've really appreciated what I'm what I'm learning from your podcast. So thank you. Uh, wow, that's so nice. What an honor. Thank you for saying that. I really yeah. appreciate it. When you talk about narcissism, you also talk about the difference between uh you you talk about emotional immaturity yeah. a lot, right? And you know, because we are not diagnosing people, like they're yeah. not I I am not a diagnostician because <laughs> I am not a therapist. Yeah. I am a coach, right? I'm gonna stay in my lane. But so let's talk about the difference between emotional immaturity, narcissism, narcissistic traits, narcissistic personality disorder. All of it. <laughs> All of right? it. Oh, yeah. my God. There's so much. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do you break it down? Yeah. Um, so I, are you OK if I go on a tiny tangent, give you a little backstory? I Always. Okay. So, so I did a, I did a decade in computer software. I wasn't a therapist mm -hmm. and I wrote a humor column and, and I just felt like, okay, this is what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. I didn't like my career, but I thought that again, this is just what you do. And then I started, uh, I, I was going to say, I started having kids, but we, we, my wife did, and we did as a family. And then I started being hilarious and humorous in my newspaper column. And so I thought I want to write a book. And, uh, and then I thought, well, I need some letters behind my name. So I'll go back to school. I'd like I like biographies. I'm that guy that would go to trade shows and everybody would talk to me about just their life, even though I'm there to try to pitch my software. And so I thought, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just get a degree in counseling, a master's degree in counseling. And I didn't even know, actually, Kate, which is funny to me that I would actually have to start seeing clients to get that master's degree. So once yeah. I started actually working with people, then I just thought, this is it. And so then I thought, okay, I've got this calling. Uh, I'm going to work with men. I'm going to help men become better husbands and better fathers. And uh, and then no one had told me that men don't go to counseling. So then I start <laughs> doing the right, counseling. Right. Your audience, yeah. right, right. Oh, honey, uh, and, tell and me I look about back it. At, yeah. Right, and master in, uh, in the master's program, the teach. It, I felt like everybody in my class would just go, "Oh, what a noble cause!" And then I and I look back on. I think the teachers would just kind of they chuckle. Oh, this guy's adorable. Yeah. yeah. 
so go cute. get them, champ. Let us, know, yeah. let, let us know how that goes for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then I get out in the world of therapy and I'm loving it. And I start moving out of software and, and computer hardware. But I still would love to work with men. So I start working with a lot of uh, addiction. So people that are and mainly it's uh, it was it was impulse control disorder, uh, compulsion issues, um, what people call pornography addiction, but that isn't actually a diagnostic term. So, right. so then I start saying, okay, it's people that are turning to pornography as an unhealthy coping mechanism, but that could be porn. It could be gambling. It could be their phones. It could be work. So whatever that unhealthy coping mechanism is. So then I, I bear it and that's now I'm getting my guys where here's where my guys are. They're right. coming in. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Because now mm-hmm. they may lose the marriage if they don't, well, you know? Yeah. You right. Go. That's what I was going to say. They're, no, no, that's what I was going to say. Are they coming yeah. to you because they're interested or are they coming to you because their wives are sending you, sending them to you? Yeah, that's a lot of it and saying, okay, I yeah. guess I'll go. And so then I have this somewhat captive audience. And then at that time, this is a while ago, I'm a very old man now. And there were people that were saying, <laughs> you know, you just need to do some push ups or don't think about it or, you know, that sort of thing. I think we're exactly the same age. But are we? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, we are. 37, <laughs> uh, Kate? 37, that's right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. That's or it. 53? Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> one, one or the other. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so then I get guys in and I realize, okay, they're, we're not even using the right tools. And so I start saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to, acknowledge that there's a a unhealthy coping mechanism, but how are you as a, as a husband, as a father, maybe in your faith, in your career, your health. So then I think if I can go find evidence-based models for these five things, then I will save all guys and all marriages and everybody will be amazing. And and we'll all live in harmony and it's unity. Such a, so it's that was, such a tidy, tidy little package. It, it is right? right. And so, so then along the way, I'm finding some pretty cool, uh, modalities to work with as a therapist. And then I, I never wanted to be a couples therapist because I didn't really know I didn't have the tools for that. So right. whenever I would even get a couple, it was a nightmare because I learned reflective listening, you know, uh, what do you hear him saying? Well, I hear him saying that he thinks I'm a horrible person. And I would think, okay, I guess like you heard it, you know, and I would step back and I didn't know what to do. So I go find this tool called emotionally focused therapy by a lady named Sue Johnson. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. EFT. It's an evidence-based couples model. So then I actually find that this is really helpful. And, uh, but then most of the people I'm working with, when they get the the right tool, then they really, I start saying, they just didn't know what they didn't know. None of us have these tools from the factory right. on how to communicate more effectively. And then those people would start to say, oh my gosh, I didn't even know how to communicate uh, with my spouse. But then there were, there were a significant number of them that just, you hand them the tool and then they weaponize it against their spouse. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right. I'm, I'm already right. digging your facial expressions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so then I, and I'm thinking, okay, this is not the way it's supposed to go. And that just led me to really start looking more at, at what was happening, which I start. And then I actually had started my virtual couch podcast. This was eight years ago. And I have an author on, I think her name was Tina Fuller. Her books, it's my turn. It's about growing up with a narcissistic mother. Mm. And, and I'm listening to her tell her story. And I start just thinking, wow, there, there are a lot of things here that I feel like I can identify with a lot of my clients. Mm. So I start looking more into the concepts around narcissism. And then I noticed in any time I did a podcast and I said the word narcissism and I was doing them every two or three months, the numbers would just be off the charts. And right. so I'm doing the couples therapy. I'm seeing that there are certain people that just, they refuse to take ownership or accountability. They can sit with zero amount of discomfort. It could not have been them. I can't get an apology out of them, even if that was my only goal that day. And so the more I start looking into that, the the narcissism. Then all of a sudden yeah. I did go through that period that I think a lot of us do where everyone's a narcissist. So I did that thing. Uh-huh. Um, right. 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 Everybody. Every, everyone. 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 And so then, and that's what led me to start looking at uh, starting the Waking Up the Narcissism podcast. And I even sat on that a year or so. And, and I tried to be really um, intentional about the name. It's waking up to the narcissism in your relationship or maybe even in oneself, uh, because right. I would run into the person that would maybe say, I don't know, maybe I'd have a little bit of that. So that's where I started introducing the concepts of narcissistic traits and tendencies. And mm-hmm. if I'm being super honest, Kate, I start I start joking about my own narcissistic traits and tendencies. Right. But yeah. as most every therapist starts to do, they realize I did actually get in this to fix myself. And, uh, you know, yeah. it was, I right. wasn't me, but I start noticing that as I'm watching things show up in my office and I'm going home and saying, man, get a load of this couple today, huh? Like this guy did this stuff. And I can notice my wife saying, okay, uh-huh. um, yeah, so... <laughs> 
Mm. Like, have you ever? Yeah. Wow. Right. And so, <laughs> so I start having to do that self confrontation thing, and I'm noticing these narcissistic traits and tendencies, and and then seeing the healthier relationships play out in my office when people do get the right tools, and and learning about how people can't. Uh, it's hard to sit with discomfort. We want to defend our fragile egos, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and then really mm-hmm. starting to notice that the the patterns are pretty solid of people that grew up with the unhealthy. Uh, models of relationships, you know, like they, who, especially our, you know, our generation, yes, right? Yes. Like, yeah. I don't know anyone in Gen X who grew mm. up with healthy relationship models. Like, no. who was teaching that? How on earth would anyone have known that? You no, know, we're barely starting to right? scratch the surface of that now. But, mm-hmm, and I like that you mm-hmm. put it that way because I think that's what started to lead toward, but I still could see people where there was this either they didn't know what they didn't know. And once they got yeah. the tools, then it was a bumpy ride, but there could be improvement or yeah. people that just, couldn't couldn't do anything with the tools because they were so special that once they tell you how bad their spouse was, then even you, Mr. Therapist, will abandon your tools and we will both, you know, gang up on on my spouse. And and so then I uh I just so at that point I'm I've started the Waking Up the Narcissism podcast. And I and I was very intentional about looking at narcissism by because narcissistic personality disorder, if you just look at the diagnostic criteria, some people say two to 5% or 4% of the population. So we can't all be narcissists. But then when you start looking at emotional immaturity, then I start saying, okay, I can start from a, hey, I think we're all emotionally immature until we have the opportunity to self-confront and grow and we get the tools. And so, and, and even the the person that maybe they're, they're why, and I'm going to go with the good old gender stereotype. Most of the people, so 20 that what 20 year, 400,000 person study that for out of the, I think it's the university of Buffalo that showed that it's mostly males show more mm-hmm. of those narcissistic traits and tendencies, but I have had plenty of women that are sure. emotionally immature, narcissistic, but I'm sure. just going to, for the sake of this, I'll say, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that a wife wakes up to this, these narcissistic traits or tendencies in her relationship. And so then when she brings these tools now in of it's okay for me to have my own thoughts and opinions. And, and, you know, and as I, as I start to express myself and then when we get the the right tools, and this is part of what I do as a marriage therapist, that then do we, do we grow from there? Can this person now start to my spouse, can they start to, to self confront? Can they sit with that discomfort? Can they look introspective? And, and if we can start to do that again, it might be a little bumpy, but now we can really start to grow. Um, right. And so, so that's where I can say, all right, well, let's start from it. We're both emotionally immature because, oh, this is, I also am very open about my ADHD, Kate. So I was thinking yeah. that was not the story I was headed toward, but, <laughs> but it really is this, it's this concept of the emotional immaturity. But so all of a sudden I would have people listen to my podcast and then send it to somebody and say, Hey, I think you're a narcissist. And right. so far, you know, zero people have said zero oh, percent of the population, <laughs> right? Zero percent of people go, Oh, Oh, interesting. Which yeah. I was going to say, you know, the the idea that you would come <laughs> home and maybe present some of these stories to your wife and her go, hmm, Tony, I'm going to look in the mirror on that. And the fact that you would then look in the mirror on that. Oh, it's is hard. The divi- but that is the dividing line. It is. It is. And so that's um, the dividing so line. It really is. not And so uh, I, I I often so I you know put my hands together. This little I say that we we are we are codependent and mesh just because we are. And I like what you're saying. Our our generation because we didn't have the right models. Um, we didn't have the right role models. We we got these abandonment and attachment uh, issues. We're afraid to that the person will leave us, so that we got to pretend that we're a certain person, so they won't leave us until then we realize that isn't who I am. And then so now we're codependent. We're enmeshed. We're starting to go through life, and we start whether it's kids and careers and sicknesses and financial things. And so we start to realize we have our own opinions because why wouldn't we? Because we're two different human beings we're that human. we're, yeah, mm-hmm. and raised at the completely different, uh, all all of it, different places, different everything. Yeah. So then of course, now we, we, you know, we go through the first time that we have to make a move, uh, maybe across country and we're gonna have two different opinions. So, but we start having these, these experiences. And then as we move from codependent and mesh to interdependent and differentiated where differentiation Mm -hmm. is where one person ends, the other begins. Mm -hmm. But then I say in the middle is so much invalidation at first. And that invalidation brings with it all this, you know, contention. And we're so afraid of contention that we avoid any tension. And that's where you Mm -hmm. find the, the kind person, which again, if I go just the the gender stereotype here, I, I, I talk about a lot of the women I work with are the pathologically kind. So they're, they're going to continually just 
give the benefit of the doubt. I I'll, I, I want to keep the peace. I don't want things to get bad for my kids, for, for the marriage. Maybe he's right. just having a rough day, you know, that sort of thing. Or he has, he has childhood trauma. Oh, yes. Right? They have, yeah. I love that you call it pathologically kind because it is yeah. right. It's pathological because they're more compassionate for the other person's trauma past trauma yes. than they are for their own current trauma. Yeah. And that's what right? I love about the stuff that you're talking about in your podcast so much is it's it, it's absolutely okay to find your voice and your mm-hmm. your value and your worth and all of those things. And I love the vibe that you put off with that because it it uh, we want to be confident. And I think what's so mm-hmm. interesting mm-hmm. is as we become differentiated and interdependent, then a lot of people, because of our immaturity, we think, well, then why am I in a relationship if this person is going to be doing their own thing? But, and that's where we never saw that model in childhood. We never right. saw our own parents be too um, confident, interdependent people doing their own thing and then having each of, each of them say, man, one plus one is now three and have mm-hmm. and have shared experiences. And we're curious about what the other person's thoughts and feelings are. We're not saying things because you must agree with me or else you're going to leave me. Or, you know, you, you're starting to wear cool glasses and and uh, fancy jewelry. So obviously you're having an affair, you know, that that kind of control or that manipulation. Right. Yeah. 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 And so or projection, and projection, as the case oh, may be. yes, so much. Pro- <laughs> right. Absolutely. And so then so now kind of back in that. So if I've got people that are saying, OK, I'm willing to take a look at my emotional immaturity. Now you hand them the right tools and now comes that discomfort or that that, you know, tension. Mm-hmm. And now can they stay present or that's where that that childhood trauma, that childhood wounding of, you know, I, I say gaslighting is this childhood defense mechanism, because if you grew up and you could not be wrong or mom and dad are going to leave me in your mind, your little mind, or yeah. so then you become a master at that. It wasn't me it, that you made me do it. I never was going to. And so in, in that, that childhood defense mechanism of gaslighting carried into adulthood, then it can, it can come with some real meanness to it, you know, Mm -hmm. very angry voices, physical violence, you know, emotional abuse, sexual coercion, uh, financial abuse, those sort of things. And so then you put that on that pathologically kind person and they're going to say, you know what, it's it's not, I, you're right. I'm, I'll just deal with this later. This is, uh, it's not a big deal. And then they lose themselves Mm -hmm. and then just, Mm -hmm. I mean, don't even really, I mean, I feel like they spend so much of their time and, and emotional calories and energy trying to figure out how do I navigate the relationship or how do I show up so that, you know, I can protect my kids. And so they don't even have a chance to figure out who they are or, or yeah. what they're, you know, who they, who they want to be. And so that, uh, so anyway, that's, that's a long drawn out way to say that's, that's kind of what got me to that place with the, the podcast. Em- yeah. To the, the emotional, emotional immaturity. immaturity. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really, I think it's fascinating. Right. And I, and, you know, as you said, it's like, it is, it's that, how are you, once you recognize your emotional immaturity, yeah, what are you now? Would you say it's what are you choosing to do with that, or what are you able to do with oh, it? Oh, that's good. Uh, or C, all of the above. Um, you know, right? I mean, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Because you no, know, what I like about that. So, and I, I promise this wasn't just a, a. I'm a horrible pitch man, but my couples therapy itself. Yeah. Um, I took that emotionally focused therapy EFT by uh-huh. Sue Johnson. And, and she has some brilliant quotes. One is that, you know, we're designed to deal with emotion in concert with another human. So I really do feel like part of if we want to become our our best selves is that because we enter in relationships, uh, this codependent and enmeshed, that as we go through life, basically, if we feel safe in a relationship, we are saying, hey, this is this is how I think I'm showing up. You know, tell me what your experience is. Um, mm-hmm. So if I say to my wife, uh, and well, let me give you an example, and then I'm going to go into my four pillars of a connected conversation, which are gold. Ooh, They're the awesome. mana from heaven. Okay. They are. Mm-hmm. They really are. Okay. So one of those times where I came home and I said, hey, check this out. I, I, I was talking about somebody that that there, I would often hear a spouse say, you know, we don't really know which version of you is showing up when you get home. And I thought, mm-hmm. man, that would be really hard. So I'm sharing this with my wife. And she says, I've, I have felt that before. And I had to then sit with the discomfort and say, Hey, tell me more. What does that look like? And she mentioned that sometimes I come home and, and I'm this guy that you're getting right now, Kate, hilarious and fun and willing to self confront and life is great. And we'll figure it all out. And, and then other times it's, you know, maybe a little bit more down. And we even identified that sometimes if I come home and the kids are saying, can we go out to eat? And and I'm like, of course we can, we can go out to eat all the time and it's always fun and everything's great. And maybe other times they say, can we go out to eat? And I think, gosh, you guys, am I, am I like a piggy bank? I mean, is that is that all you guys care about? And then I realized, wow, you know, when when she's bringing that awareness, 
I have Uh an opportunity now to self-confront and grow. And I'm grateful because my first thought was, oh no, I'm the fun guy all the time. And if I'm right. not, it's because you guys are being a bunch of jerks, right? I mean, what am I right. supposed to do? <laughs> right, right. right. But, then that, that, exactly. but then if you're able to really say, man, this person, I, they have a better, they may have a better view of me. I'm a, And again, no asterisks of narcissism or, or severe emotional immaturity here. Uh-huh. So I want to hear what their opinion is. Now I can mm-hmm. say, I'll take a look at that. Or I can say, man, I hear you. I feel like this is something I've really been working on, but mm-hmm. I want I want to take that data in. And when I did, it was uncomfortable, but I realized, man, it really is sometimes as simple as uh, as a practicing therapist. If somebody paid me in cash that day, I might come home and it's in, you know, well, cash isn't real. So we should go out to eat and spend it, you know, versus right. uh, it might be uh, I just paid some bills or that sort of thing. And then I'm, I'm, thinking, oh my gosh. Stressed about money. Yeah. 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 yeah, Right. 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 So so those are me issues. Yeah. Right. Right. Which we, and we, and I just want to clarify, like we get to be in bad moods in our lives. Yes. Right. But it's, but we also have to be responsible for the impact that it's having on other people. And that's why I like what you said about choosing versus like, what am I able to do? Because I really feel there's a, boy, there gets to be a fine line. So now let me me take you down the four pillars path and and I think we'll, we'll make some sense of this. So so I really wanted to develop a bit of a framework because, and I really think that some of this did come from if you are having two just emotionally immature-ish people that want help, then this uh, framework can be a little bit more flowy and loose. But then I found that, but we need a framework if there is somebody in the relationship that we maybe think is more emotionally immature or narcissistic, because if they can't play in that framework, then there's not going to be consistency in the relationship. And then that means that it's always going to be um, a, a situation of, okay, this works until it doesn't, or they're willing right. to do this until they aren't, or mm-hmm. they're being amazingly awesome until they decide they don't want to be. Mm-hmm. And so, so, mm-hmm. right. So this, so my four pillars, there's the first pillars. I say that nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what, how can I hurt my spouse today? What, what can I do to really ruin their day? Or there's a part B to pillar one, which is, or there's a reason why somebody shows up the way they do, because it might be that if they never saw a healthy relationship modeled and you, you have a spouse that is just withdrawing, you know, and, and, and that's a, if I'm saying, okay, I don't think they woke up today and said, I'm going to wait till my, my husband gets home. And then I'm just mm-hmm. going to completely withdraw and shut down, you know, that they, they right, aren't saying right. that to hurt the person, but that might be, there's a reason why, or they're not doing it to hurt uh, the other partner. So that leads right. to my pillar two, where I, I say, and you can't tell somebody that you don't agree with them, you think they're crazy, or or you you think what they're doing is absolutely wrong. But here's the key, even if you think they are crazy and you don't agree with them and what you think they're doing is wrong. And you'll start to see, Kate, the 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 point of the four pillars is I want to keep the conversation from going out into the weeds, from going mm-hmm. into the tip for tap, from going into the pursue yeah. and withdraw, blame, you know, yeah. blame mm-hmm. all that, right? And yeah. then that leads to pillar three, which is questions before comments. And then, um, and so now I'll start to lay out just a pretty common example that's very real. And this was one where, uh, where a husband did come home and, uh, his wife said, you know, I just, I feel like you really just don't care about me. I feel like you just come home, you grab the kids and you just, you don't even care that I'm here. And so he wants to immediately say all the things, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, right. How dare you? And well, do you know, I've had a rough day, but if you're doing my pillars, so we've got, he has to assume good intentions or there's a reason why she's saying what she's saying. She didn't say, I cannot wait to hurt him today with this, this information. Right. His pillar two is I can't tell her that that's ridiculous. You're wrong. That isn't what's happening because guess what? That's her opinion. And that is what she's seeing. That's and so then that, yeah. it's her feeling. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then pillar right. three is questions before comments. So this is where I start throwing out the, what this starts to look like is, okay, let's say that he says, okay, I can do the assumption of good intentions. She's not trying to hurt me. And even if I feel like I am going to, I am being present school on a daily basis, I can't say that's wrong. Pillar two down. But sometimes that pillar three is the guy wants to say, okay, let me just tell you though real quick that you don't even know how hard my days, but you know, so if they do the comment before question, it shuts the conversation down. Right. So if he says in that moment, then, okay. Um, uh, tell me more. Like, what does that look like? And help me see my blind spots. And, and uh, you know, how, what, what is your day like? And what is that like when I come home? And what are the kids like? And I want to, I want to have, uh, this is where empathy starts to develop. Mm-hmm. And and it's right. really hard. This pillar three can be hard because when we have just been told you're, you know, I, I, this is how I feel when you do this thing, we want to defend our, our ego. That's the part where, you know, cause, and right. we think that that's the right thing to do, but that's, it's actually a little bit selfish because I want to get rid of my discomfort and, and I'm going to put it back on you. And now it's a you thing. 
So that Mm -hmm. pillar three, okay, tell me more. And then my pillar four is now that person has to stay present, lean in and not go into a victim standpoint. And and again, I hope you can tell by now, I I use a lot of humor. So (laughs) this is where I like to say that the pillar four guys are horrible with this one. So let's say that they do the, I'm going to assume good intentions. She's not Mm -hmm. trying to hurt me. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, even if I think that's ridiculous, I've been, I'm, I'm doing great things. I can't tell her that because that'll shut the conversation down. I'm going to ask questions. Help me see my blind spots. Okay. She just said to me. Uh, you come home, you take the kids, you take them out back and you don't even give me a kiss. You don't even say a word. So pillar four would look like in, in the positive version is he's like, man, thank you for sharing. I'm leaning in the the bad version of that is if he's like, OK, I, I am just a, yeah, I guess I'm just a paycheck. So I just guess uh, I'm just a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. So just right. You yeah. T- yeah. why don't you just tell me what to do? I'll do it. And then um, that'll make you happy because that's where the the emotional immaturity comes in. And the guy wants the wife to rescue him. And she wants you know, he wants her to say no, you're, I appreciate it. You are doing amazing things. I'm sorry. And then he'll go, Ooh, that feels better. Right. And now it's all about him and stroking yeah. his ego and making yeah. him feel better when she totally. was the one who came to the conversation, not feeling and that, good. And that took courage for her to do that. So when I'm, yeah. when I'm doing mm-hmm. the couples therapy though, what, what can be difficult is this framework and it needs to be there's uh, in that scenario, she's a speaker, he's a listener. And then there has to be a one full round. I know you're an actress. I like to say one scene. You know, yeah. so, so now that she feels heard and understood, which is amazing. And yep. and so now, right. but now he is going to, I thank you so much for sharing that because if you, if you care about this partner of yours, I am so grateful that they had the courage to bring that to me. And now I go back to that yeah. and I want to be differentiated. I want to maintain a relationship with this person, even if they are frustrated about something, I'm grateful yeah. they're bringing that up because I either want to self confront and grow, or I want to, I want to. I want to assure them that, okay, I appreciate that because maybe this is something they're bringing up from their childhood and I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. I want to say, I, that would be hard. I mean, I, yeah. I hear you, but now it's where I want him to be as speaker. She's listener, same rules apply. And in this scenario, it's him saying, thank you. I mean, that would be really hard if you feel like I, I just ignore you because that, that's the last thing I want. And then he did say, I, I felt like we had a conversation a few weeks ago where, you know, you, you're with the kids all day, you feel overwhelmed and you can't wait for me to get home. And so I really felt like I was coming in and I'm just, look, I grab the kids and I run to the back and I'm juggling them and you'll look out the window and go, my hero. But he says, uh, but I hear you. And that makes sense. I can understand why. Cause now, you know, and, and this one makes it sound like it's so easy because then we, right, we, right. Had a, we talked a little more and, and she just would love for him to say, Hey, how are you? And I see you and, and I give her a little kiss. I'm going to take a kid or do you want to go in the backyard and I'll finish doing whatever. And so that's, you know, again, that's the one where they live happily ever after. And this unicorn runs across the land and they find the pot of gold and it's great, Kate, right? It's amazing. I mean, it's, right. Right. But, but, exactly. but right. Yeah. But, but I like that. But I like the, fr- and that's why I say, but having a framework. Yes. Then, I like then, the framework. Yeah. I like it a lot. To me, it feels a little it feels like imago therapy, but less like I started with imago. Completely yeah, yeah. strict, right? Yeah, totally. No, um, I like that. Um, but what's interesting too, I, I I imagine there is like a almost like a a framework within the fourth pillar that's like you don't get to like you you get to say you get to respond, yeah. but not make it about you. So right? it's so funny you say that, Kate, because this is where in your right there there's so many things that happen within. This as so, and I, I, I think when I was promoting a marriage course, I did. I counted up, and I think I've worked with uh, now it's maybe fifteen hundred couples over seventeen mm, years. Wow. Yeah. So, so I know I get to sit from a place of, I, I know when somebody is weaponizing the tool, and so that's where somebody can even say, "Well, I feel like you're being mean. I feel like you're dumb. I feel like you're." Know, like, okay, right. right. Just because you yeah. say I feel doesn't mean you did that right. And so, right. and or I love when somebody will say they'll look over to me and they'll say, "Well, what do I do? She's not doing the four pillars." And I, and I say, "Okay, will you then use the four pillars on the fact she is not using them? Meaning, pillar one is assuming good intentions, or there's a reason why she's not because she doesn't feel safe." You know, and he's like, oh, I didn't like that one. Yeah. You know, right. That's, yeah. Ah, yeah. I love <laughs> so, and, and, it. I love and that's it. where I feel uh-huh. like it's it's hard because people that and man, can I uh, can I go on another tiny tangent? Uh, uh, you can, absolutely. Yeah. I'm digging, <laughs> absolutely. I'm digging your I love vibe. It. Okay. I so, love so, your tangents. Yeah. Okay. So the the whole premise even around waking up the narcissism was that as a person now, now they've kind of given that background. People are are figuring out this emotional immaturity or narcissism on the fly. They don't know what they don't know. And so right. then when they when and this is where I, I often say the premise even behind the podcast was 
as a practicing therapist, I know that when you know people read about narcissism and all of a sudden they think, wait, my spouse may be narcissistic, you know, and, and I and I make I go overboard with this joke, but it's almost like what they read says, don't finish the paragraph, pack your bags and go, because it won't get better. And even right. if I may personally and professionally feel like, yeah, it's a you know, there's a pretty good chance this could be a, a it, yeah. it may not play out well. Deal breaker. Yeah, but that person is that pathologically kind person. That's why they're in that position. So they still are wondering, am I the narcissist or am I the one that's right? And I saw that you, (laughs) I love that you're on that same page too, because I I hear that so often. And so I know that they can't, they they have to go in and and figure out, is this relationship viable? Even if, you know, from my chair, it breaks my heart because they're, they're the ones spending so much time and emotional calories and energy trying to figure out how, what can I do different to change my spouse? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. what, you know, um, before we hit record, we were talking about it a little bit like, right. Yeah. Is that I think that, w- that so many, and I'll use gendered language because of my mm. audience. Right. But so many women in particular, right. Yeah. They want to understand the narcissist. They want to understand what narcissism is yeah. so that they can then get a, you know, go about fixing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. For real. And they hear that it's, you know, based in childhood trauma, yeah. So, you know, so like, okay, I'm going to heal that and then he'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's heartbreaking. And I always urge women, like, take all of this, like, understand this and and learn about narcissism, not so that you can then take it back to him and try and fix totally. him and change him or be like, Hey, I think you're a narcissist. Yeah. But to understand that what you're experiencing is real and that you're not crazy. And now for a quick word from our sponsor, the all new fully revised, should I stay or should I go? After three years of this program existing in the world and changing women's lives, I decided to give it a full makeover. The all new version has all new videos, a podcast like audio stream, if you want to take the work on the go and completely updated resources for deepening your learning. The program consists of six core modules. The first of which is, who are you? This is the section in which you dig deeply into your own personal development and get in touch with your inner guide, slay your inner critics, mine for values, and learn how to set healthy boundaries. The second module is how you learn to love and helps you understand your attachment style, love languages, and how to properly love and care for the most important person in all of this, yourself. Module three is called, Why Are Women So Exhausted? And breaks down some of the issues around toxic masculinity and male entitlement, the myth of being a stay-at-home mom, and answers the question, he's fine. Why can't I just be happy? Module four is all about understanding abuse and includes videos on trauma bonds, understanding the cycles of abuse, particularly how they play out in your own relationship, and addresses addiction, infidelity, and mental illness. Module five is all about healing and moving forward and includes videos about therapy, couples therapy, healing from betrayal, emotional regulation, and grief. This section also includes my 90-minute workshop, Tackling Codependence, as well as my signature relationship inventory that will help you gain complete clarity on all the parts of your marriage and figure out what's his and what's yours. And module six answers the question, is the grass really greener on the other side? With in-depth videos on dating, cultural and religious isolation, and what happens if you end up alone forever? Spoiler, you probably won't. Whether you decide to stay or go, this program will set you up for a lifetime of clarity and fulfillment. And if you've already decided to go, the program will help you unpack all that's happened and help you heal so that you can move forward without repeating the same mistakes that got you here in the first place. This program is priced super low at just $697. And if you use the code PODCAST, when you check out, you'll get $50 off the full price. What are you waiting for? You have been agonizing with this decision for long enough. It's time to finally know, should you stay or should you go? And now back to our episode. So then I start the podcast I, I and I come up with these five things that I need some cool acronym for. It's two years later, but that when people are trying to figure out their relationship with the narcissist or an emotionally immature person. So uh-huh. I say, okay, you've got to raise your emotional baseline. That's my version of self-care. It's a theory like I, I came up with a long time ago. Get your PhD in gaslighting. 
So, yes. you know, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Get out of unproductive conversations, set healthy boundaries and know that a boundary is a challenge to the narcissist or the emotionally mature. But the biggest one is this fifth one is know that there's nothing you will ever do that will cause them to have the aha moment or the epiphany that has to come on to uh, at them. And That's I right. love what you're saying because right. I feel like the people do get these others down pretty well. And I mean, mm-hmm. self-care doesn't mean they have to go run a marathon. They can start listening to podcasts. You know, they can start reading right. books or join a group, a Facebook group or something. But by the time they get this information, they still want to then help that person because they care mm-hmm. about them, have the aha moment or the epiphany. Right. And then that's right. And right. That's exactly and when, right. And when it's the and when it's the narcissist or the emotionally mature, what you're doing is you're handing them more buttons that they'll use against you when they when they feel insecure and and immature and they are lashing out to defend their fragile ego when they're going into that black or white thinking or that all that, or nothing. And, yeah. that, and that is like that is like say it again, oh, right? Like yeah. say it again. Um, because you can't right now you you can, I think, right, take away all of um, sort of the guardrails and all mm-hmm. of the, you know, the cushioning of the bottom and all, yeah. right, you can you can take all of that away and maybe they'll hit their bottom. Maybe they'll have some form of narcissistic collapse, which, yeah. you know, is, but y- you, you can't you can't manufacture it. You can't facilitate no. it, right? You can't be like, well, I'm going to go. When like, watch me go, I'm right. going, I'm going, yeah. I'm, I said I'm leaving and then hope that they're going to have some kind of collapse and then be like, it's okay, I'm here. Right. Like, no, that doesn't, no. it doesn't work. No. And Kate, right? what's so good about that example is that then they'll say, well, remember you leave, you you leave now all the time. And now, now the kind person's like, okay, but I, I was trying, you know, and then it just they right. feel and worse. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And you this this so the other the 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 four things before right the the self care yeah but how did you put it you you had so a different name I said, for it uh, raise your emotional baseline that's my yes. so that one I, yes. I long ago I love- had this uh, I'll spare the story but it's basically that when we are firing on all cylinders our our baseline of emotions is high mm-hmm. and then um and then as we start to feel worse it lowers but everything's coming at you from the same you know same plane so when you mm-hmm. your baseline of emotions is so low you can't even reach the tools you need to to interact with the world so right. when people are just saying hey you just need to do this well you know they just need to go screw themselves or whatever and so so yes. raising your baseline yes. can be if somebody comes into me and they feel just devastated i'm literally saying uh, read, read a book, you know, go pet yeah. your dog, do anything. Go, and it bumps like, the baseline a little, eat. you know, eat, you know, yeah. eat, right. Yeah. Go T- for take a walk a shower. in nature. Uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Exactly. This is not like, oh, well, you need to engage in radical self-care. It's like, no. fuck you. I can barely yeah. fucking function. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause then, cause then I always say that every little bit that the baseline is raised at some point, you may get to the point where you have enough traction that you can start to use the big tools. And this mm-hmm. is where I even, you know, when I, when I've started doing therapy, um, I mean, I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I can't, I can't uh, prescribe medications. But I, but at mm-hmm. first, I thought, oh, people aren't going to need medications. But then I start working with real people who want to go play in traffic, and I think, okay, maybe a medication would be good. And then when right. I throw that in this, uh, this emotional baseline theory, sometimes I say that, okay, if your baseline is so low, you are beating yourself up because you can't even find the tool to do mindfulness or to go on the walk. Sometimes a, a good medication will bump the baseline up high enough you can get the tools. And now you can really bump the baseline up higher. So if you decide at that point that I don't want to be on a, on a medication, now you you're you, we can plan on it. We can prepare for it. And your baseline might dip a bit, but you still have mm-hmm. the tools to recover. But a lot of times if people are, if they find the right medication, they may even say, but I feel good now. So why on earth am why I, am I going to take? Yeah. That's what I always say. I'm like, I, I say you can take my Zoloft out of my cold, dead hands because <laughs> it ha- makes me a functioning human being. And for me, it's my Ritalin. It 100 it is. I mean, if it may even yes. shock me, look like I'm not on it right now. But, you know, <laughs> but it's totally like I, I, I stayed away from it forever until because of this fear. But then it changed my life. And so, you know, if that's the, what that's you right. need, then you need it. And uh, that's right. And it kind of yes. leads into I love the way you put that. Well, when we talked about before we started too, this, uh, my, my individual therapy modality of acceptance and commitment therapy, what's interesting yeah. is it does kind of start to, I think that we so often go to this place of like, but I, but I hate the fact that I need to take medication because maybe I've been emotionally abused for 20 years. And, and this is the, I don't know, are you ready to go on this one? The uh-huh. act train? 
Yes. Or do, I, well, or did I, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something else I wanted to say, I think, before we get there, which is about this, about this, like raising your emotional baseline. Emotional baseline. Right. And and I think that this, this probably the, the acceptance commitment therapy probably yeah. contributes to this too. I, I always say to clients like, right, we have to focus on yourself. We have to, mm-hmm. I know what it was. It was something that I heard on your, okay. the way that you put it on your podcast. And I, I sort of talk about it in this way. It's like, when you know who you are, right. Someone can say something to you. Yes. And I always talk about it like green hair. Like if I am super confident in myself and I know that I don't have green hair, like if someone says, well, that's like, if someone says to me, you have green hair, my response is, um, no, I don't. (laughs) Right. And when you are confident and you know who you are and you have that, um, that, you know, solid emotional and heightened emotional baseline. Yeah. If someone says to you, you're a narcissist or well, you're the abuser or you're this, your response is literally like, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm, I'm literally not like, I know this about myself. Right. And it's as if you have, someone is telling you you have green hair. Yeah. I like that. What was the example? that? So, so I took this from the, there's an author named Eleanor Greenberg and she writes a lot about narcissism. And she had in Mm -hmm. one of her articles that I loved, she was talking about, you know, we use, we don't use narcissism the way it used to be used of, of in this uh, healthy version of narcissism. And I made a joke about, yeah, that, right. So, and I, and I pulled it up right here. So I'll read this because I'm glad you said this because this, I love this whole concept. So she was talking about normal or healthy narcissism. And so I am, I am absolutely taking ownership that I'm going to take that word narcissism and, and call it ego. So healthy ego. Yes, so so this is a, right. This is a realistic agreed. sense of positive self-regard that's based on the person's actual accomplishments. It's relatively stable because the person is assimilated into their self-image, the success that came as a result of their actual hard work to overcome real life obstacles. Cause it's based on real achievements, normal, healthy ego is relatively impervious to the minor slights and setbacks we all experience as we go through life. Like you say, somebody saying you've got green hair, Mm -hmm, normal, mm -hmm. healthy ego causes us to care about ourselves, do things that are in our real self-interest and is associated with genuine self-respect. One can think of it as something that's inside of us. Now, contrast that with pathological defensive narcissism, which is the opposite. And if I go back to the story I told earlier about when I was uh, uh, in the computer industry for a decade. Right. That's what it was. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. It's, oh no, I got, I got the chills because it's like, I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so the Uh pathological defensive narcissism, when I talk about my own emotional maturity or narcissistic traits and tendencies. So this is a defense against feelings of inferiority. So the person dons a mask of arrogant superiority in an attempt to convince the world that he or she is special. Inside, the person feels very insecure about their actual self-worth. So this facade is so thin. This facade of superiority is so thin. It's like a helium balloon and one small pinprick will deflate it. And this makes the person hypersensitive to minor slights that somebody with healthy ego wouldn't even notice. So instead, somebody with this type of defensive narcissism is easily wounded, takes any form of disagreement as serious criticism, and then is uh, likely to lash out and devalue anybody they think disagrees with them. And they're on guard trying to protect their status. And what is so interesting about that too, Kate, is, yeah, when I was in the computer industry, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I pretended I did. So I would go Mm -hmm. to these computer conferences and somebody would say something about, uh, I don't know, how does your software handle sectors put in the primary defect list? And I maybe had heard a programmer say something about it. I'm like, well, we think the primary defect list is dumb, you know, and then and yeah. by saying that, I just, I just made myself You're making shit a complete up, right? buffoon. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so then I find the career I love, this therapy career, and now I, I love it so much that I'm, I, there's nothing I'm going to say that I don't feel like I have worked hard on. Because it's easy when you feel more confident to say, oh, I don't know. You know, in the world of pathological defensive narcissism, I would say, well, actually, research says, and in my mind, maybe I'm saying, I got to find some research that says this thing, you know, because this sounds pretty good. Or people are making stuff up in the moment to get out of the discomfort and they want to have that one up position and be special. Yeah. So, and this is really interesting because this is also a trait of a codependent. Yeah. Right. Because I did do the same thing before I got into like intense recovery, you know, yeah. over 25 years ago, where if I, di- I couldn't, I couldn't not know the answer. Yeah. I couldn't oh, not know. I, it wasn't safe, what you're right? Yeah. It wasn't safe for me to not know the answer. And so someone would ask me something and I would just make shit up. Like you're talking about, yeah, like I, totally. I would literally make stuff up. I, like now as I, as a, as a sort of more evolved and healthier human, I'm horrified and embarrassed by it. 
but I'm also like fascinated by the oh, psychology. Okay, I love of the it. honesty of it. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and I think it really harkens back to these childhood abandonment wounds or attachment mm-hmm. wounds, because we're afraid that if we are not special and we don't get the validation, that then we will be devalued and our parents will sell us to the circus. So I right. better know everything and I better That's pretend right. I know everything and I better not have done anything wrong. So I'm going to gaslight and I'm going to make stuff up. And when you're a kid, it's adorable. Like, oh, really? You're a uh, to your eight year old. Oh, you're married. You have a job. Like, that's adorable. But the little kid's right. like, they're, they're buying it, you know? Yeah. Right. And they're, pra- and they're right. praising me. Like, this is cool. So, uh-huh. Uh-huh. so now we start right. to turn, you know, right. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So, so with all of this, let's turn <laughs> yeah. towards your, the acceptance act. and commitment yeah. therapy act. Right, which is designed to help elevate yeah. this baseline. A so okay, bit, and right? I told you before we started that this is where I'm. I need to go get a soapbox, and I'm going to put the wind machine in my beard now. And I need to just I this is it. this stuff is amazing. So I, I and I'm going to make it quick too. Uh, every I, I, no, it's safe to say every every therapist learns um, a type of therapy in grad school, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is mm-hmm. you know your CBT, your thoughts lead to your emotions, your emotions to your behaviors. And I was a CBT therapist for years, almost a decade. And what it starts with is your, your stinking thinking, your automatic negative thoughts. And so you got to stomp out the ants, automatic negative thoughts or, and, it, and I feel like most every influencer, motivational speaker still operates using this tool of CBT. You just got to wake up in the morning. You just got to yes. have a change your mindset. You just got to decide today's the day and I'm going to kill it, you know, otherwise known as toxic positivity. Thank you. My- well said, well said. So then, right. so then, you know, and you would even as a therapist, you'd say, okay, well, uh, the person hasn't called you back. It's been a couple of days, you know, you, you feel like you, something's wrong with you, or maybe, maybe they like broke their phone. Maybe they dropped it in a lake. Maybe their grandma needed it. And she, you know, and then the person, and you, I feel very, this is my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think that that, alleviate, I get back to this concept of what do we do to get rid of our discomfort? And that yeah. will make that person feel good in the moment. It's like, you know what? Yeah, that feels better. Maybe, yeah, maybe they, their grandma did bake it into a cake and we're going to find their phone on their birthday. Who knows? I feel better <laughs> as I leave the room, but now I'm sitting there at home and all of a sudden it's another two hours. In your again. own thoughts. Yeah. Right, and I'm like, right, okay. Right. And now I can't even, I can't even buy into that story that I did with the therapist. So now I feel worse. And so right. it starts with the, you're broken. Now just change your thought. And then how'd that go champ? And so that's where I feel like as the therapist, it's, you know, if you're like, Hey, how was the week? And you even start to watch the client go, it it was good. No, yes. I'm still trying to change those thoughts. Like that's cool. Right. And then, and then, you know, and and I, the funny part here, let me stand in that healthy ego. I'm glad we gave that definition, but I get a chance to work with some pretty, um, higher end people at times because uh-huh. of my uh, podcast or whatever. And it's funny because I will get to work at times with people that are out there putting that message out to the world. And then uh-huh. I'm getting to talk to them about when they're saying, okay, I'm a piece of garbage because I, you know, I don't do what I say I'm going to do. And I don't put that message out. And what's wrong with me back to the, what's wrong with me story. So right. in, in comes act acceptance and commitment therapy. And it's the new kid on the block in therapy. Cause it's like 20, 25 years old, but it's now, mm-hmm. I don't know, 4,000 peer reviewed studies that show that it is so much more uh, effective than, than the CBT than model. CBT. Uh-huh. Cause it, instead of saying it starts with your broken, just think different. And then how'd that go? It starts with the, you Kate are the only version of Kate that has ever walked the face of the earth with your nature, your nurture, your birth order, your DNA, your abandonment, your rejection, your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your time on Sesame street, your time on Grey's anatomy, (laughs) your cat, your everything. You're the only you. So if we start from there, you think and feel the way you do because you do period. So, and that's an amazing place to start from because then instead of the what's wrong with me, or I know I shouldn't think it, you start with a check this out. I'm thinking this because this is the very first time I've ever been in the moment as me right now. So check that out. I'm thinking about the fact I should have gone to the bathroom before our appointment. I'm thinking about the fact that I wish I wouldn't have scheduled a three o'clock after us as a therapist, because I'm digging this conversation. Those are thoughts, (laughs) nothing wrong with me. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So if we start from there, then it's like, it's just now it's like, now what do I want to do? And there's a couple of cool concepts. I'll just lay this out. Maybe we can talk about this in a future episode. Yeah, yeah. Now we're gonna, we to we're be, obviously yeah, gonna do this again. <laughs> we, we are, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so what's so cool is then we start to recognize. And I think this plays into the the audience that you speak to and the people you coach and the, these wonderful, pathologically kind people. So mm-hmm. then, the, another concept in ACT is once I accept the fact that I'm I'm okay. It's actually okay for me to have my thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And yes. so, if anybody else is telling me you shouldn't think that. And it's a real quick way to say, I, I don't even know why you're telling, like, I'm me. Right. This is what I right. think and feel. Yes. Yes. But then, but then ACT has these cool concepts. One of them is that if you're doing something because you think you're supposed to, which is the way most of us are until we aren't, 
is mm-hmm. they call them socially compliant goals. So if I'm doing something because I know I, I should do this because mm-hmm. my parents mm-hmm. told me, my spouse tells me, my religious community tells me, my friends tell me, society tells me, I guess I should. But if it isn't what it really is something of value to me, mm-hmm. then then that socially compliant goal, it goes against our own process of becoming. So our motivation to continue is, is weak and ineffective because mm-hmm. when we're living a life of things I think I'm supposed to do because then yeah. I, I, I don't really, I'm not engaged in them. These aren't right. what really speak to me. And then in an act you talk about, then that leads to a concept called experiential avoidance, which means if I don't really like what I'm doing, then I'll do it later. And I'm going to now do these other things. I'm going to answer some emails. I'm going to play a couple of games of online bingo because it actually works really well with ADHD and you oh. may win money hypothetically. Right. Um, but I'm going to do okay. these other things first. And then when I don't end up doing the thing I'm supposed to, yeah. Now it's, it's, and, and I make these comments of now it's the afternoon. I did all these other things and now I feel like what's wrong with me, but I'll do it tomorrow. And then if we hit Wednesday or Thursday, then, you know, tomorrow becomes Monday. And if we hit the 16th of the month, then I'll do it next month. And if we're in July in a few days here, then I'll be like, you know what? New Year's, then I'll, I'll do it all then. Uh, but at the core of that is that I actually don't know who I am or what I even want or to do but right. I think I'm supposed to do these other things. So, right, so right. act is an amazing tool to start to learn to accept the fact that you are, and then yeah. you think and you feel, and then now you do a lot of work around what are your values. So if you have a value yep. of, you know, curiosity, or you have a value of adventure, or you have a value of order. I've heard of that, you know, mm-hmm. those kind of things, then <laughs> you have to find, you have to live in, in accordance with your values or else you're living yeah, this life of uh, social 100%. compliance. Right, yeah. right, right. So or, what does that bring right, up as a, mm-hmm. is hearing that? Like, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. And so then what happens, right? Because there are things we quote have to do yeah. that we don't like to do, right? But I think what do I hear we, you Kate? say it do I'm kidding. I'm being very no, dramatic. Tony, screw yeah. it. <laughs> screw it. We <laughs> okay. don't. Okay. Um, but you know, you so I, I guess what I'm hearing you say about that is that when you're pushing those things off and you're pushing mm-hmm. them off and they're pushing them off, you are it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. Like every yeah. time you Every time you push it off, you feel worse about yourself and then you feel worse about yourself. And then, and then it's, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And so is part of the commitment that like, okay, I'm actually going to, is it like eating the frog? Is it like, you know, is it? Okay. Yeah. No. So the great. So um, I'll give you, I'll make it so quick too. So when you find out what your values are, then you start to choose value-based activities or goals. And so Mm. I do like to give this example because we're about to do this. I I go on a, I've got a son and a son-in-law and we go to uh, the NBA summer league in Vegas every summer and have the the proverbial boys trip. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, I think it was before COVID. And then it was where, okay, we had these cool seats and I'm there with my guys and we play golf and we watch basketball, but it's, you know, third game in a row. And I remember just sitting there and I was kind of feeling flat and down. Uh-huh. And that's the part where it's really easy for us to say, what's wrong with me? I'm here with two guys that I love. I'm, I've got these great seats and we're doing this fun thing. Man, I must really stink. But instead mm-hmm. of that, what, what Act says is like, oh, check this out. Right now I am feeling flat. Like Mm -hmm. that's a feeling. I have all kinds of feelings. So Mm -hmm. now I'm going to notice that thought. And now I'm going to turn to a value-based goal. of I really do have this crazy value of just curiosity and knowledge. So Mm -hmm. I do this often. I pull out my phone and I start just looking at players and Googling them. And there was a a one, one guy that's really tall. And I like, well, what European country is he from? I'm being very judgmental. And it's like, oh, he's not, you know, but then, but then he'd also had a nine pound spleen, no uh, tumor on his spleen in college. And all of a sudden I'm like, guys, check this out. What is a spleen? You know, and then we're Googling things. And then there's another guy that was this high draft pick and he's getting outplayed by this guy that we can't, we never heard of. And then we see that that draft pick, you know, it actually been suspended in college. And so now what are we not doing? We're not, we're not telling ourselves what's wrong with me. We're not just trying to change our thoughts to, well, I just need to, I just need to be happy. I just need to focus. No, I noticed that I'm thinking because I do it often. And Uh then I, and then I, now I, now I turn to a value-based goal of, of, um, curiosity and knowledge. And now I'm doing and being the commitment piece. And Uh now I'm just in that moment. And so, and this is what I love about it because I, I really feel kind of passionate about that model often the CBT model mm-hmm. or the just mm-hmm. wake up and do something different model. Yeah. You know, I, I think it, it it often then leads to the what's wrong with me story, which I yes. hate that because it turns yes. out nothing. You're just being and doing it's just then who it, you then are. It tur- right. Mm-hmm. Then it turns out that it does the, okay, well don't think about it. And it goes, oh, this old bit, oh, right? God. 
Don't right. think about a white Don't polar bear wearing a top <laughs> hat right on a bike, you know, <laughs> slapping people with a fish or we all just did it. So okay. I can't tell myself, don't think about it. I have to go, oh, check that out. I'm thinking this. Mm. And then I, and then the third piece that, so I can't say what's wrong with me. Nothing. I can't say, don't think that. Cause I'll think about it more. It's a survival mm-hmm. instinct. It's called mm-hmm. a psychological reactance, the instant negative reaction of being told what to do. And then the third thing is I can't just say, well, instead of this, think this other thing. Cause then I'm, you know, instead it's like, oh, I notice I'm down. That's a feeling. Yeah. Um, later I'm gonna have a feeling of hunger. I'm going to have a feeling of whatever. I have all kinds of feelings. So why am I giving so much credit to the, these feelings? Right. So let me the turn, let me turn to a, thing. yeah. So let me turn mm-hmm. to a value-based goal. And then, and then now the feelings that typically come with that are, you know, the adventure connection. I'm having a, a shared experience with, with these guys. And I'm no yeah. longer even, I don't even notice that I'm thinking I want, you know, I don't have to yeah. stop. Now thinking you're, something. you're not flat anymore. Yeah, you've shifted, totally. you've shifted your way, your experience and your feeling without, without making yourself yeah. wrong for the feeling. Absolutely. And meanwhile, I'm yeah. learning more about myself. And and mm. when I did a podcast on this a long time ago, it was funny because one of the guys now call back to the beginning. And one of the guys I'd worked with, with, you know, turning to pornography as an unhealthy coping mechanism. He's like, well, I think that's dumb because when I look at my phone, I start looking at porn. And I said, well, that it's, you have to find your value, which goes back to what we're talking about. Where right. Right. Find, it's, it's your opportunity to to become and to find out what matters to you. Not, hey, guys, do you think I should do this? Because I don't want to hand that power over to somebody else. That's you know? right. That's right. And yeah. it is, I don't know if porn is a value, but. <laughs> no, exactly. I don't think so. I don't right. think so. Right. And if love and connection is your value, porn is probably the antithesis. Of yeah. That, which is well, a whole a, other a podcast. Oh, okay. We got, uh, little do you know, we have a lot of podcasts in our future now. I, I, I do know. I this do know. Very, I'm this is very, very easy excited. and natural. Yeah. I know. I know you're amazing. I'm really excited to continue on. And I'm also mindful of time that I you know. have that now you, you have, have to go to the bathroom and do that before you my have three to the o'clock, right? And go to, yes, exactly. So, and, and I got to get a picture of us too. So, okay. But what a joy. Yeah. yeah okay. Amazing. Um, yes. Yeah. Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? I <laughs> am. Let's do it on the, okay, here we go. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I will, I will share that with the world. But no, I, pre- I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, this was a joy. I love it. And I look forward to uh, to many more. Tell everybody where they can find you if they don't already yeah. follow you, which is ridiculous. No, it's very kind. So uh, yeah. TonyOverbay.com, but then, and then I have uh, Waking Up the Narcissism, the podcast. I've got a premium Q&A episode that is uh, $4.99 a month. I've never really tried oh, cool. to sell something like that. And that money is going to help women that are needing counseling or legal fees or that sort of thing paid. So that's a cool little venture. I've done eight episodes. It's just Q&A. So that's a premium mm. paid podcast. And then I've got the virtual couch, which is my 380 episodes later. Just, I love that one. It's all things mental health. And then Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, the more I find out about you, I also, I'm three episodes into one called murder on the couch. I know. I no, okay. I, I haven't I haven't okay. gotten into it yet, but it's I am so fun. super stoked. <laughs> okay, so you, you, I would love for you to come on that then too, because uh, I do it with my daughter Sydney. She's hilarious and fun. She brings up the stories. I I wax on philosophic about all things therapeutic, and and we want to get to have guests on at some point too. So I when I read that you that. dig those, yeah, so we'll have oh. you on that too. Yeah. Oh, beyond like there's probably not a case <laughs> I don't know and can't. Okay, like, then that'll be just, fun. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm okay, so, so we'll have you on that. And then people, I have a book uh, about he's a porn addict. Now what? No, um, mm-hmm. expert and a former addict answer your questions. I play the role of the expert. And then uh, I've got a marriage course and a parenting course and a addiction recovery course. And I love all that stuff. And yeah. There Everything's on your website. <laughs> Tony Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Kate, what a joy. Um, Tony, thank will, you so yeah, I'll much. I'll reach out to you soon and let's have you over on waking up the narcissism and then we'll just change the world. I love it. Okay. Thanks, Hello. Kate. Thank you so much. Hey, talk to you later. All right. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.